gayet güzel bir şekilde benim birçok dostlarım, Avustralyalı dostlarımın olduğu gibi göçmen dostlarım var. İtalyanlardan, Yunan göçmenlerinden, Arap göçmenlerinden birçok dostlarımla beraber burada mutluluk içerisinde hep ilişkilerimizi devam ettik. My name is Alex and I'm the owner of Handsome Her Cafe here in Brunswick Moorland. We wanted to first and foremost have a cafe that was going to centre women and other marginalised groups. We have a few house rules. Women have priority seating. The second one is that men are asked if they would like to pay a premium, which at the moment is 15%, which is reflective of the gender pay gap and that is always donated to a women's charity to try and reduce our waste as much as possible. So when customers come in and want to get a takeaway, they can uh, borrow one of the mugs of the emergency mug wall. It's really a place for people in the community to come together, to talk to each other um, and to spur some action. I'm so passionate about the community in Moreland. I believe that real change happens at the grassroots level and at the local level. For these Moreland Awards, I encourage you to nominate inspirational women in the community. We all know incredible women who are doing great things and it's time to bring them into the limelight. Hi everyone, I'm Councillor Natalie Aboud, the Mayor of the City of Moreland. I've lived in Moreland for the last 13 years or so. I'm raising three little boys with my husband and spend a lot of time outdoors in the local parklands. I've always been someone who's had a great interest about what's going on around me. So it sort of was a natural thing for me to put my hand up and run for council. I love the fact that you can get so heavily involved in community projects and there's lots of really active people in the community. I really love the diversity of this city. I find it fascinating that you can be alongside the creek and feel like you could be anywhere from Warrandyte to the Otways. But then you can be in a boutique looking at locally designed clothes or eating some incredible food from pretty much anywhere in the world. I'm really looking forward to developing easier ways for people to get across the city. We really need to make sure that we keep a handle on the way we manage growth, development, transport or waste. We need to make sure that life in the city gets better for the people who live here and I do feel like it has been. We need to keep a handle on what's happening and make sure needs are being met. members of the gallery and to our viewers live streaming tonight's meeting. My name is Councillor Natalie Aboud and I'm the Mayor of Moreland City Council and the Chairperson of tonight's meeting. It is my pleasure to welcome you to this meeting. Our meeting is being held on the traditional country of the Wurundjeri of the Kulin Nation and I acknowledge them as the traditional owners. I would also like to pay my respects to Elders, past, present and emerging and Elders from other communities who may be here with us today. I acknowledge that currently many Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people call Moreland home. I also acknowledge that the Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people never ceded sovereignty of their lands and have, been, and have continuously cared for their country for over 60,000 years as the world's oldest living culture. Members of the gallery, please note this council meeting is being recorded and web streamed live to council's website and Facebook. This recording will also be available as video on demand. Gallery attendees are advised that they will be recorded during the meeting. Councillors, a reminder that in line with the adopted Councillor Code of Conduct principles <coughs> outlined in the Councillor Code of Conduct, councillors should ensure that they conduct themselves in the meeting with integrity, impartially exercise their responsibilities in the interest of the local community and not improperly seek to confer or advantage any person. This behaviour will support the principles for leadership and good governance that secures public confidence in the Office of Councillor. Councillors and officers in attendance. I'd like to introduce the other councillors in attendance tonight, starting from my right, Councillor Sue Bolton. Councillor and Olivia Carly Hannan. Good evening. Councillor Helen Davidson. Good evening. The Deputy Mayor, Councillor Mark Riley. Good evening. Councillor Ali O'Farnley. Good evening. Councillor John Kavanagh. Good evening. Councillor Dale Martin. Hi. 
and Councillor Lambros Tapnos. Good evening. The officers in attendance tonight are Chief Executive Officer to my left, Narina Di Lorenzo, mm -hmm. Director of Community Development, Arden Joseph, Director of City Infrastructure, Grant Thorne, Acting Director of City Futures, Phil Priest, Director of Business Transformation, Sue Vucevic, Director of Engagement and Partnerships, Joseph Tobacco. I now would like to ask for a motion to suspend standing orders, please. Councillor Mark Riley, seconded by Councillor John Kavanagh. All those in favour? Against? I declare that carried. So now that we've suspended standing orders um, and in keeping what we've all been witnessing and some of us have been advocating for in the media, um, I'd like to read a statement on behalf of the council and it reads as follows. Mullen City Council welcomes the decision of the Thai courts and the Thai government to drop the extradition procedures and to immediately release Hakim Al Arabi to return to Melbourne. Council has strongly supported this course of action and wrote to the Thai Prime Minister calling for Hakim's release on the 17th of December last year in 2018 and firmly believes that this situation should not have happened with Hakim and should not happen with any other refugee in the future. Council also acknowledges the powerful advocacy taken by the Pasco Vale Football Club, the state, national and international local, sorry, international football bodies, former Socceroo, Socceroo Craig Foster, the Australian Government, humanitarian organisations and other supporters. Moreland is home to many asylum seekers. Through its commitments in the Moreland Human Rights Policy 2016 to 2026, Council is responsible for creating conditions that respect human rights in the municipality and, is, and to ensure dignified access to services for all residents of Moreland. As a local council, we respect and value asylum seekers and their democratic right to participate in and contribute to the life of the community. We recognise their human rights, struggle, resilience and determination to secure a safe and secure future for themselves and their families. We commit to welcoming asylum seekers into our community <coughs> and to giving them fair access to our services. As it says at the front of the building, one community proudly diverse. Thank you for indulging us. We just want to jump up and take a quick photo, please, um, and then we will resume back to the meeting. Thank you, everyone. I'd now like to ask for a motion to resume standing orders. Uh, Councillor Riley and Councillor Bolton. All those in favour? Against, declare that carried. Uh, Mayor, I'd like to move a motion to accept the statement and record it in the minutes. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. I'd like to second that. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. I'd now like to move to apologies. Councillors, I've received an apology from Councillor Dorney. Are there any further apologies from fellow councillors for tonight's meeting? No, if there are no further apologies, I will move to requests for leave of absence. Uh, there are no leave of absence request to consider. May, may I um, move Councillor Dorney's apology? Oh, yes, you may. Thank you. Move that. And seconded by <coughs> Councillor Davidson. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. Um, before I move on to <coughs> conflicts of interest, I'd just like to acknowledge that we have heard from Councillor Oscar Yildiz, who's running late this evening, so he will be joining us. I'll now move on to disclosure of interests and conflicts of interest. Uh, councillors, are there any interests or conflicts of interest to declare this evening? Councillor uh, Martin? Councillor Martin? Uh, 
Um, yes, so I believe I have a, a conflict um, with one of our last um, items on the agenda in relation to the uh, fleet state purchase contract. It's just a, DCI. Yeah, DCI um, 119. Yep. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, Councillor, immediately before we consider that item, I'll ask you to provide details of the type and nature of that conflict of interest. Um, so I might need some assistance from officers on this one. Apologies. It's a, um, a perceived um, conflict due to uh, conflicting work duties. Sure. So when that item comes up, I'll ask you to leave the chamber before the item is moved and return after the item has been considered and voted on. Uh, if there are no other conflicts to declare, I'll move on to the confirmation of the minutes of the last council meeting. Councillors, could I please have a motion for the adoption of the minutes of the council meeting held on 12th of December 2018? Councillor Riley, seconded by Councillor Kavanagh. Is there any debate on this item? No? Uh, all those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. Uh, councillors, now that we have confirmation of the minutes, and as we do not have any special committees, we'll move on to petitions. Petitions. Uh, councillors, we have received a petition, PET 1 slash 19, request to close Cash Street Coburg. Do I have a mover for the petition to be received? Councillor Bolton and a seconder, Councillor Riley. All those in favour of accepting the petition? Against? Declare that carried. Uh, councillors, do you have any petitions to be tabled on behalf of residents? So, petitions tabled by the gallery. Uh, councillors, if there are no further petitions to be tabled, I'd like to ask if any member of the gallery has any other petitions to be tabled this evening. Okay, thank you. <coughs> the next thing to do is uh, move on to public question time. So, public question time is an opportunity for 30 minutes for people to raise questions with councillors. I'd like to outline the process. Please note that if your question relates to a matter on any of the reports, this is a time to raise that question with us. Questions can also be submitted online prior to the meeting. A maximum of two questions is allowed per person, and questions that relate to a matter listed in the agenda will be dealt with first. When I invite you or your representative, you must ask the question without taking longer than two minutes. I will ring a bell at one minute and 45 seconds, except I don't have a bell, so I'll do something, um, which means that you'll have 15 seconds to wind up the question. If you have submitted a second question, it may, at my discretion, be deferred until all other persons who have submitted questions have asked their first question and or not be asked if the time allotted for public question time has expired. A maximum of three questions will be heard on any one subject and we will proceed into, onto the next topic if time allows, and if time allows, return to the previous topic. Either myself or another councillor will answer your question or, or I will ask the Chief Executive Officer to either provide a response or refer it to another councillor officer. Council officer. As detailed in the meeting procedure local law, section 3517, as chairperson, I have the right to disallow certain questions it is defamatory, indecent, abusive, offensive, irrelevant, trivial or objectionable in language or substance. If a further response to your question is provided at tonight's meeting, there will be no formal further response. However, Council will action any commitments made in answering the question. Question time can only be extended for one 30-minute period and only for the purpose of responding to questions that are related to matters listed on this evening's agenda. If your questions cannot be answered, it will be taken on notice and responded to between now and the next council meeting and reported in the governance report. We have 30 minutes and I want to make sure we hear all the questions, so I request that councillors who answer address each question succinctly. Councillors, the 30 minutes of question time, sorry, pardon me, commencement time is 7.08, 7.10. So, would, uh, Peter O'Donnell, would you like to step uh, forward up to the podium and ask your question? Yep. I would like my companion to be, to be before me with a question that was saying, Subject. That's fine. Is, 
Yeah, but we've got ten going built. Come forward, Tim. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor, I'm Tim Glanville. I'm representing the uh, Lord Exposed Community Group. Uh, I've got two questions. Yeah. I've got two questions. Will I be able to ask both now? It should be fine, yeah. Okay. My first question relates to agenda item NOM 319. Uh, my question is, will Council do something to reduce the current oppressive of fees, which, uh, oppressive cost of fees, which are applied to people when they ask for plans that the Council gets? Um, uh, I've got two minutes on this. I was recently charged uh, $700 for copies of plans. Uh, I, Council of Alton has a copy of my receipt if evidence is required. Uh, of course, um, people are saying we're all computerised now, but uh, you've got to realise that people in the community have various levels of computer literacy and access. Uh, some people have no computers at all. The other thing is that the developers and council officials have the capacity to produce large plans in colour. Most people in the um, community do not, and you need the large plans in colour when you're consulting uh, with residents and businesses about developing proposals. So um, and it's, it's just not good enough to say you can come along to the meeting and you'd see plans in colour. Uh, as I say, I was charged $700. I'm quite happy to pay a reasonable amount, perhaps up to $100. I consider $700 to be totally oppressive, as do many members of the community. Did you want to wrap that up into a question? Yes, I've already asked my question. Yeah, Will the council... Oh, OK, sorry. Yeah, I've already asked my question. Yep. Will the council currently consider, uh, consider reducing the current oppressive costs which are applied to people when they ask for public plans? Thank you, Tim. Um, did you want to ask the second question before we get an answer for you? Or did you want the first answer and then the second question? That's we get an answer to that. Sure. Yeah. yeah. So, because this is an item that's on the agenda tonight, we wouldn't make a predetermined decision, but it will be addressed um, during the agenda, and I can probably bring that item forward now that I know that you're here waiting to hear that. Yeah. I guess the only other thing I'd say is, if you agree with the council agrees with me, I would like a partial refund of my seven dollars. Yeah. Well, rather than have a debate about it, I'll I'll just let you take that answer, and um, we'll move on to the next question, if that's okay. My next question relates to agenda item DCF three nineteen. This is the one about a streamlined planning process, which is concerned, which has caused much concern in the community. First thing I'd say is that we've been given extremely short notice about this, and this is a very major tr uh, change to council planning procedures. We understand the councillors were only advised of these uh, new plans one week ago, and in fact, we were only advised two hours ago. Some councillors will, con will confirm that. Of course, a major part of councillors' role is to consider planning applications. It's officials' role to advise. It's not officials' role to make decisions. Uh, we don't think the council should be giving up this major role. And of course, it takes away a uh, major component of the community's uh, possibility of influencing council. The current procedures are a careful balance between rights for developers and rights for the community. This proposal completely overturns that. Now we've been told that the planning that you know we'll still have the planning and information discussion and you'll still have VCAT. So what's the problem with that? Well there's several problems. Over 15 years we've been involved in kids and we find them uh, pretty ineffective. They usually consist of objectors putting their point of view, developers putting their point of view, and then the officials saying you can't resolve it, so I'll have to refer it to council. So we don't think kids are a response to councillors not having the authority. Secondly, going to VCAT, well, you can still go off to VCAT. Well, these days, going off to VCAT costs $3,000 a tonne. Uh, and there's such development pressures, especially in Brunswick, where we are, that we could have five or ten a year. Sorry, well, Tim, I just am very conscious of the time. Okay, so I'll, I'll wrap it up. Uh, there's just two further things I'd like to say. How many other councils have this streamlined and undemocratic process? I believe it's none in Victoria. 
And secondly, uh, have you received advice from uh, local government Victoria that you are within the law doing this? Thanks Thank you, Tim. Much. Uh, I think I'll ask the Acting Director of City Futures to answer the question on behalf of the Council. Thanks for your question, Tim. So in relation to the design um, excellence scorecard, this has been something that we have been um, discussing with Council over the past 12 months. It is a proposal that sits outside of the planning system in most parts in encouraging better quality development, um, lifting the standard of development in terms of accessibility, in terms of um, environmental sustainability and public benefit. And it is a, a proposal to influence a better standard or um, design excellence throughout Moreland. In relation to the changes in, um, in respect to process, the design scorecard provides that planning applications will still need to meet everything within the planning scheme. They will still need to be an acceptable planning outcome, as well as meeting the requirements of the scorecard. The proposal before Council in the agenda tonight is that there would be no change to public consultation. There would be no changes to um, consultation meetings with residents. And in fact, we expect with the change in process that there would be a greater emphasis on um, the planning and information sessions as well as consultation meetings in order to get acceptable outcomes. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'll now ask Peter O'Donnell to come forward to ask his question. Thank you, Peter. Yes, um, Peter O'Donnell, I'm, from, I'm talking about DCF319. Now, given the momentous changes that are being proposed to delegate approvals for developments to the planners rather than to the council, and given that the, that the scorecard has already been devised without the public knowing, and given that there has been no community information campaign undertaken and the great majority of people in this municipality have no idea about what this council is planning. Indeed, it wasn't even on the agenda until about a week ago. How could this council possibly make a decision given all of those shortcomings? Now, the council has introduced, or the proposal introduces the year of a one year trial. But a one year trial represents the automatic, almost, denial of rights for one year. It's not as if it's some concession to good planning, to good management. So I don't know why that would be in there, except I suppose I could be suspicious and suggest it's just to make the proposal sound a little bit more attractive to the people who would, at, at this point, know nothing about it. And furthermore, what would be the use of an a evaluation after one year? After one year of such a dramatic change, a proposal that's been introduced for one year, what would be the worth of an evaluation? It's just another way to make the whole proposal, if I want to be suspicious, seem a little bit more democratic. Thank you, Peter. I just ne need you to wind it up, please. Yes, I've learned. That's my question. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you, Peter. Thank you for your question. Um, just going a little bit further in, in terms of the scorecard, it is not looking at all to remove public notification from the process, the right of um, any resident or business to object to a planning application. Um, there will still be those full rights and there will still be an emphasis on meetings, consultation, access to planning offices, um, access to councils to be able to attend planning and information discussion meetings. And there will still be full rights to VCAT if any member of the community remains concerned with the planning decision that's made. 
The other piece of context I would add would be that each year, Moreland Council, other councils make the majority of the planning decisions under delegated authority. So we deal with between 1,500 to 1,800 planning applications a year. And of those, a very small percentage in the order of three to five percent for most councils, including Moreland, would actually go before the planning committee. So we're talking about a small amount of applications. Some of those applications may be ones that choose to take up this voluntary scorecard and would therefore continue to be processed under delegation than rather go to the planning committee. Thank you. Councillor Bolton. Question. I think um, either I misheard, but um, one of the questions of the previous reason I don't think you answered, um, I think the one about which other councils have implemented this. <coughs> did you answer that already? Um, or so this is a new innovation by a proposal by council. Um, it hasn't been tried by any other council, but though, as I was mentioning previously, systems of delegation um, vary across, um, across all councils. Um, but it would be quite common that the amounts of delegation that's um, provided to officers, particularly in metropolitan councils, is very high um, and less than 10% of matters um, going before a uh, planning committee. The scorecard is a completely new idea um, in trying to influence better outcomes, better design within Moreland. Thank you. I'd now ask uh, Jo Perry to please come forward and ask your question, Jo. Good evening, Jo Perry, Faulkner Residents Association. Um, I can't believe that uh, what I regard as Council's fast track development proposal um, is back this time as the uh, trial design excellence scorecard. Uh, Spring Street has made sure nothing stops development, even implementing a framework that deliberately suppresses objections of residents to construction in their own streets. And how did so many developers respond? Is more than the wash with quality, responsibly designed, livable, sustainable instructions? No, it's not. They squeezed every possible cent out of their projects they built over every inch of green space with no regard for climate change, heat island effect, and future community and social needs. Instead of responsibly accommodating all cars on site, they applied and received waiver after waiver that resulted in quiet streets turned into ugly car parks. It's actually hard to believe that the profit at all costs, toxic behavior of the banks could possibly be surpassed but it has, by so many developers. At a time of headlines, filled with stories about the Spencer Street high-rise cladding fire, the Opal Tower disaster in Sydney, and predictions that far more examples of construction failures are ahead, Moreland Council proposes to reward and incentivise developers to now do the right thing with a design excellence scorecard that will ultimately result in fast-tracking their, pro their projects and further inhibiting the community's objection to development. Sorry, Joe, I'll just get you to get to the question. And so the question is, Thank you. why? Well timed. <laughs> well, well timed. <laughs> Thank you, Phil. Thank you, Joe. The question of why, um, what the scorecard seeks to um, achieve is to incentivise a higher quality of development than what we currently see within Moreland. It seeks to incentivise greater accessibility within development for our growing population. It seeks to incentivise improved environmental outcomes and it seeks to incentivise um, public benefit. Um, potentially further greening of our municipality or whatever else might come forward as a suggestion of improved public benefit. We have purposely, purposefully not looked at this as a fast track 
system. Um, the only way to really fast track development is to remove public consultation um, and the time um, that, that goes into getting better outcomes through that public consultation um, process with the community. So the scorecard certainly does not seek to reduce any opportunity for public consultation through planning consultation meetings, through discussions with officers, um, through access to councillors, through those planning consultation meetings. It does, however, seek to give a certainty of process that it would be a delegated process. And have I, as, as I've mentioned, the majority of planning decisions made within metropolitan areas are um, undertaken through um, a delegated process. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'll now ask Benjamin Armstrong and Janine Honey to come forward to present their questions. Uh, good evening. Um, we're both here relating to Newlands Road which and the traffic report which has just been completed and we weren't notified about at all, um, which would have been nice to be know it was on the agenda tonight. Uh, my main points, there's two of them. One of them is about the roundabout, which in the report it states that it's too expensive and impractical to put in a pedestrian crossing there. It probably overshot the mark in what's required. Uh, I think when I came here last time I was talking about the fact that you can't even get from the footpath down to the road because there's no you know, decline into the road. So anyone with a wheelchair, pram, kids on bicycles have to go to a driveway considerably further down uh, McMahon's Road and cross on a diagonal angle across to the only up ramp to the footpath. And when you're in this position, it actually blocks the view of oncoming traffic. So um, it would seem the person who completed the report, it's appreciated, but maybe a, a bit of ground level observation and trying it out um, would have been informative to them. Uh, and then secondly, in the report, it states about the bicycle lanes, which, I mean, the bicycle lane sort of helicopter dropped in. It starts at uh, a roundabout and connects to nothing and continues up Newlands Road. It's only on one side of the road and the site it's located, which it's, it's incorrectly states, and it correctly restates in the report that it is faded, but unfortunately it is full of parked cars day and night, including when I cycled here, there were six cars, which more or less on average since... The, your, I read your report for the agenda has been the, the case every day. So this pushes you out into the road with concrete trucks and then you get to the roundabout which then funnels in and tightens, meaning that there is no room for a bicycle at all to go through that intersection or share it with any traffic. So my question is being, uh, can you possibly implement a separation of the bike lane and can the McMahon's and Newlands Road roundabout be looked at from a ground level perspective so it can be crossed safely, even if you're not going to put any further infrastructure there? Thank you. Uh, Bill, this one's over to you again. Thank you for your uh, question. Um, I'll need to take the question on notice, and go back and um, ask the officers to have a further look at um, look at those matters for you. So I um, appreciate the question and um, um, yeah, we'll take it on notice at this yeah. point. Yeah. I mean, I'm, if your officer is interested, I'm happy to do a site visit there with him if it would help. And because, I mean, because I'm a resident and utilise it every day, I also see what happens most of the days is pedestrians cross into the middle of the roundabout. So Ben, what I'll do is I'll organise for you to follow it up with Phil and we'll take this offline and sure, fo that's fine. follow it up. Yeah. Yep. So my email's there if you yep. want to yep. click and on. And we've got your phone number, so more than yep. happy to ensure that you're, site you're contacted. Would be good. Yeah. Thank you. Janine? I'm going to suggest that the officer that wrote this didn't actually go to Newlands Road at all and has perhaps just looked at the road on a map and fails to understand the unique problem that is a small residential strip of no more than five blocks that backs on to an... A, should I stop talking? that backs onto a major industrial yeah, road. The, the only problem that we've got with that, Janine, is um, the element of accusation. Because 
because it's not okay to make an accusation of what the officers may, may or may not I feel like done. perhaps the person didn't visit the road or something. What would be good is yet. if you could present the question and talk about the background. Right. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. In the report, you discuss passenger vehicles. We're not talking about passenger vehicles. We're talking about heavy vehicles that travel well over the speed limit. In the report, you discuss alterations made to the wrong end of Newlands Road. It is a very long road. We are only interested in the five blocks of residential nature. We're not interested in what happens up the other road, end of the road near the tip, and very few of the residents actually go down there. We go into the city. All we want is the speed limit reduced, and there's on page 118, it states that council officers do not support the reduction of speed to 40 kilometres an hour because they do not think it will be adhered to by road users. If the majority of rules and laws governing the population were made based on this logic, what type of society do you consider would be the result? That's kind of a rhetorical question. So my question is, can we please look at it again? And can we please look at it with an officer actually going there and spending time on the road in the residential section sure. and the residential section only? That's a fair question. Uh, Phil, would you like to respond to that? Thank you. Um, I can... Um, advise that officers in producing a report of this nature would have inspected the site um, and the entirety of Newlands Road. I think they took the guidance from the council resolution which talked about Newlands Road so we may have missed the um, emphasis that you're seeking of just a certain section of Newlands Road so they have looked at the entirety of Newlands Road based on the resolution of, of council. Um, it's not a general hoon problem. It's sorry, sorry, to name, vehicles. sorry, to name. Sorry, This is a matter that's on, on the agenda tonight for a yeah. decision by council. So yeah, I might thank just you. leave it there. I thank think you. that um, there isn't an opportunity to engage in a debate in the chamber about it. So I know that Ben, your question will be followed up outside of this place. But I feel like um, maybe that's the best thing to do together. Councillor Bolton. Sorry. Um, I don't know if you can stay for the rest of the meeting, but um, I've just to let you know that I have um, proposed an amendment around particularly the speed limit during the residential area and the pedestrian crossing at the roundabout. Now, I don't know if councillors will support me on that, but um, I mean, there are other issues. Uh, which were raised in the original motion that officers aren't recommending. But I think those are two key issues in my mind. There are other issues, bike lanes and so forth. But I think, uh, anyway, I'll see um, what other councillors think about that. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Uh, Gary? Thank you. Uh, good evening. My name's Gary Ram. I've lived in Oak Park for 40 years and things are just getting out of hand in the, the area. I want to hear um, from the planning minister what his priorities are when issuing a permit in the area and can he tell me um, whether the permit for 8 Victoria Street has gone ahead or not for a building there and I'd also like to talk to the Minister that looks after traffic movement and in the area. So, which one will I go for? Okay, so I'll just clarify. I think you mean the officer. We all want to talk to the ministers there, yeah, not in this place. Who's ever yeah. in charge of so, What I'll do is. Um, so there you If you'd like to have the minister, is that telling Yeah, but, but do you mean you want to talk to the officer in this place or you want to talk to. Whoever stamps the traffic. permits yeah. and gives yeah, the okay place. for building. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah. I want an answer on that. Mm -hmm. What's his priority <laughs> and when he looks at a permit and says, bang, we'll, let, we'll build that. Okay, Gary, just hang on a second. Narina can help clarify some of what yep. you want. I just want to clarify something. Yep. So if it's a building permit, council processes a small number of the building permits issued in the city. They're actually issued by private building surveyors mostly. Mm -hmm. So if you'd like to talk to a council officer um, who looks after the ones that council has approved, very happy to do that. Um, mm -hmm. But the general system, most of it is actually done by private building surveyors. Mm. So I'm pretty sure permit? he's referring to planning permits. Yeah, uh, I would assume. As such. Yeah. Yeah. Because of the units, one to do the units and things yeah, no, like no, that. Yeah. Yeah. 
Okay, so yeah, just to I, clarify, I, even though you've written building permit, you mean a planning permit yeah, yeah. through the planning department here yep, at this place. The yep. Okay, so um, I'll pass this to you, Phil, but I suspect the best thing to do is maybe organise a meeting for the future. Because yeah. mm. it will lead on to the second question that I've got with the other minister. <laughs> Officer. Um, thank you, Gary. The planning decisions that are made by council are made having consideration to the Moreland Planning Scheme. That covers a great breadth of issues, which I'm happy to give you a call tomorrow and have a conversation with you about mm -hmm. that. Yep. And I can also follow up on your the other part of your question related to um, a particular planning application. I take it, take it yeah, is that 8 was, Victoria Street? Yeah, 8 Victoria Street. And there was also one that was in uh, Pasco Vale Road that you gave the go ahead for. Um, so rather than engage in a debate, yep, sorry, Gary, we'll, we'll get you, yeah. that's okay, I'll get you to talk about that later on, but did you have a second question? Yeah, to the yeah. Minister or whoever looks after um, traffic and safety of the area with the flow of traffic. The officers, yep. Yep, who's ever in, looks after that. Yep. Is there anyone either? So, that's the question. Yeah, that's the question. Well, my yeah, question, the question is, yeah. with all these permits, all the um, units that are being built, it's creating a chicane effect in nearly every one of our streets where units are built. I can give you a whole list of them. There's even a, uh, where there's a building on the corner of Chapman Avenue and Cloverley Avenue that's going to be a new suburb because it's that big. Mm. And the overflow of the cars that are going to be parked in there, they're going to be parked in the street. The other streets that are all, I can give you a list of streets that are all forming into a chicane. I live in Victoria Street. And the corner of uh, Victoria Street and Pasco Vale Road, I don't know what you, whether you know the um, history of that corner, but it's a notorious corner for accidents. And my time being there, I've actually gone and done the first aid course because go down and help some poor bugger that's had a... Oh, sorry, yeah, poor yeah. person that's had an yeah. accident there. There's one set of units that have been given the OK and it's right on the intersection or leads right out into... Victoria Street and Pasco Vale Road. So Gary, when they're completed, I reckon in, within the next 12 months that people move into there, they will be guaranteed to be in an accident. The so safety Gary, of that place is it's ridiculous. Phil, would you like to respond to Gary? No. No. <laughs> Thank you, Gary. Um, I guess what I would say is at this point in time, Council is working on a strategy. Um, in relation to both the management of traffic and the management of parking into the future as part of um, um, that strategy is called the Moreland Integrated Transport Strategy. Mm -hmm. When we have a discussion tomorrow, I'll have a further chat to you about that and how you, how you can um, engage with that strategy. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. That's about but Very quick. Is, yeah. Sorry. Do you look yeah. after the... Um, You'll be able to follow that yep, all up you. in conversations with Phil. Thanks for your time. That's place. my first yeah. time. Thank feel you. Free, yeah. look, um, feel free to get in touch with any of us if you want to talk about all of the processes. and yeah. It's much well, more I, complicated I, than I, it I've seems. I've tried that and I was given a number and I was told that someone would get back to me. Okay. That was last year. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thank, Thank you. Thank you for your time. Thanks. Okay, so we... Almost made it within 30 minutes, so um, and we've run out of questions for this meeting. So I'll say that that concludes public question time and now move on to the council councillor reports. Um, I think it would be prudent to... Well, I'll start with a design excellence scorecard because it's the next thing. Um, and Councillor Kavanagh is on his feet. I'm happy to move the officer recommendation. Uh, Councillor Martin to second. So does the mover wish to speak? I'll reserve my right to close the debate. Thank you. <coughs> Councillor Martin? Oh, thank you. Um, so thank you to the residents as well for coming along tonight. Um, I, I can appreciate that if you only picked up the agenda last week, you probably think that this is something that we came up with in the last month. Uh, but I can assure you it's something we've been working on for um, since the start of our council term. It actually started with the council plan. Um, and it's actually written in our council plan that this is a process that we were going to explore. Uh, we have since dropped um, exploring a design review panel process um, since it was advised by officers that um, unlike the New South Wales uh, planning scheme, a design review panel process 
Um, if we were to implement it, it wouldn't have to be adhered to by VCAT. So we've, we've actually gone with a different approach. Um, unfortunately, in Victoria, anytime we want to change the planning scheme, um, which is the two or 3,000 page document that guides everything that we do in this city, we have to go to the planning minister and say, can we please change that element of the planning scheme? The last couple of times where we've tried to change it, including things like mandatory heights, the minister said no. Not allowed to do that. So we're trying to be innovative. We're trying to think of another way that we can actually influence developments in our city. What we've come up with is a scorecard that basically says you need to meet the planning scheme and then you need to deliver five elements, which is high quality building design, high quality ESD, high quality building accessibility and high quality community benefit. So what that means is of the 1,800 planning applications which are decided by council each year, 20 of which are decided by the people in this room, what we're looking to do is to influence those 20 applications each year out of the 1,800. So of, of that 20 which we decide each year, we want to try and influence those. Of the applications that come through at the moment, if you were to ask what percentage of those applications coming to us are a 7.5 star rated building, have silver level um, accessibility for the housing and include any level of, of, of affordable housing, I can tell you the answer is zero. And so what we are trying to do is to actually seek to influence those 20 applications each year to improve um, to have buildings that we do not currently have in this city. And so uh, while I recognise that it might seem that we are, um, you know, we've completely lost our minds and, and what we're doing here is something that's really reckless, but what we are trying to do is to influence 20 applications out of 1,800 applications each year because we cannot do it through the traditional way, which is to a, make a planning scheme amendment and ask the minister to change the scheme. So what we are doing is, as a result of that process, is to go through and try and seek excellence. These are gonna be excellent buildings. Currently, we have none of them. And so, if by the end of the trial period, and the reason why we've had a trial is because we want to actually trial this before we adopt it completely and have this as part of our, as part of our process going forward. What we really, what we really want to have is, sorry, um, is to really explore this trial. At the end of the trial, we'll, this will come back to council, and we will debate, and we will see how many of those buildings we have uh, we have developed. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Good amendment. Uh, yes, Councillor Bolton, would you like to put your amendment? I it through a bit earlier, but uh, did it get to people? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I haven't read any emails but, since. Um, so basically, it's a fairly simple amendment. <coughs> to um, ma for a new point one to be inserted, then the rest of the points can be renumbered. The new point one is to read, prior to consideration of the trial Moreland Excellence Scorecard, the council organises a public meeting in Brunswick Town Hall to allow residents to discuss the proposal. Um, I'll just, oh. yeah, as a mover, uh, it's not acceptable. To be honest, I'd be happy with a tr with a public meeting after the twelve month period, but I think we should get on with it. Yep. Um, so no, that's not acceptable to the mover. It's not acceptable to the mover. So I need to find out if Councillor Bolton has um, a seconder for her proposed amendment, and Councillor Lambros has his hand in the air. So we need to um, debate the amendment, and I'll ask Councillor Bolton to put her case. Yes, I um, I totally understand where councillors are coming from who support this proposal uh, because we do have a lot of terrible um, development applications that come before the um, Urban Planning Committee, nowadays called the pa uh, Planning and um, Other Matters Committee. Um, but I, and while it might be true that only a small percentage of the applications come to that committee each year, the rest of them are decided by council officers. On the other hand, it's most likely that these are the most contentious 
um, planning applications where um, residents haven't been able to make a, uh, reach a compromise with the developers um, at the planning and information discussion meetings. Um, while, yes, residents will be notified about developments, will be able to put in objections, will be able to attend the planning and information discussion meetings, where, which are sort of really attempts to get a mediated outcome, but often there's no, I mean, often there's no outcome along those lines. Um, and yes, residents will have the right to apply to VCAT to overturn a decision, but that means if the council has approved, approved it, um, that means count, uh, residents have to pay a massive amount of money, I believe in the order of $3,000, um, to take something to VCAT. Um, so this is really cost shifting onto residents. Uh, onto ordinary residents. So it will mean that even if residents are negatively affected by uh, a planning application, that um, the reality is most residents will Sorry, not be Councillor applying. Councillor Bolton, can I just interrupt you to find out if you're speaking to the amendment or I'm the motion? I'm speaking to the amendment. Oh, so I think this is such a major change to our procedures. I think there needs to be a level of public consultation, which is why I'm proposing that we not, the council not consider um, the trial until after a public meeting. Yeah. Mm. Councillor Tapanos, would you Thank like you. to speak to um, him? I, I would, and I'll be brief, but I reserve my right to um, speak on the substantive later and also an additional mm. amendment. Um, uh, look, um, when I first got elected to council, one of the key principles that I decided to, um, well, I think we all did decide to take in our council duties was to have an open and accountable council that consulted our community. This is a big policy change for me, and we haven't heard the views of our residents about it. Um, we normally would do that on many planning matters. We normally would do that on many policy issues. I think that this has the potential to radically change our city for the better or for the worse. The and I do think that it does um, require higher levels of community consultation and input, particularly from residents who are quite active and community organisations who are quite active in Moreland around planning matters. So I think it's the right thing to do and I think it's part of providing good, open and accountable governance, a principle that I think we should all adhere to. Thank you, Councillor Tepanos. Uh, Councillor, I had Councillor Kavanagh and then Councillor Ryan. Uh, I want to speak against the amendment and the reason is because unfortunately I don't agree that it's going to make a lot of difference in the city. I actually wish it would, but I believe that we've set the bar so high, and I'm not apologising for that, but we've set the design excellence so high, as we should, that I don't think many uh, applicants are actually going to take us up on the offer. Right? We've gone from a limbo dance to a high jump bar in, in this. The ones who are going to reach this standard are going to be so exemplary, and I hope they are, but they're going to be so exemplary that I think they're going to be well received. And I do believe that if we get one or two or three in 12 months, that will be a number that we should be pleased with. I don't believe we're going to get inundated. I do believe then that we can then in 12 months time say to residents, and even if the building isn't built by that stage, which it probably won't be, but we can say, this is what we've got right, from this development by having these design plans, rather than going to residents and saying, well, we've got these ideas, but we can say this, is, this applicant actually came to us and this is what resulted from this, and this is what we and they can compare that to what we've been getting under the current scheme. I think a meeting in 12 months' time, if we have one or two examples, would be a perfect time to inform residents. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Riley. Thanks. Um, yeah, I've, I've heard sort of accusations about undemo undemocratic Moreland tonight. I find quite disturbing. Um, the report quite clearly talks about, and I've been at most of these, and, and other members of the community have been in these meetings, there's been a round table of community members and professionals in the industry and officers. There's been a housing advisory committee meeting, which Councillor Bolton um, co-chairs with myself. There's been an urban environment committee meeting, and there's um, been another environment meeting as well, where opportunities for community to be involved. So there's a whole range of engagement and uh, consultation that we do in our community. Public meetings are one way of engaging. Um, however, I 
believe that we've been discussing this for over two years. It's not a secret. It's in our council plan. We publish that. We advertise that. It's up there on the on the council site. So this whole idea of secrecy, I find quite offensive, actually. And if I think it's up to you, as members of the public, to take, pay attention to what we're doing as well. Yes, we need to tell you what we're doing, and we need to get our community education out. And I've been arguing for that for a long time. We've actually reorienting our community communications team at the moment as I speak to do better at that. But there's a there's somewhat of a responsibility, I believe, on you to follow what we're doing. It's not all on us. And so I don't think a public meeting is needed every time you do something. I know some councils in the chain would run by public meetings everything you, every time you want a decision. I don't think that's good enough. I think we've actually done a lot of consultate, consulting. We've heard different views. Not everyone's happy with it, I agree. We aren't, there isn't great consensus on it. There are concerns around it, but we do want to get some good outcomes. And the whole idea of this is to try and lift the standard of design, the materials that are used, the environmental sustainable de de uh, development aspects of it, the star ratings, often seven or 7.5, the performance of the building, accessibility and visibility for people um, with wheelchair and other mobility Council issues, Valley, and community be benefit. Amendment. Yeah, so I just think those things have been discussed. We don't need to go to a public meeting to have further discussion about them. Thank you. Are there any other councillors who would like to speak to the amendment? Councillor Davidson. Um, I'm going to speak in favour of Councillor Bolton's amendment and propose an alternate as well to say that we meet after the 12-month trial um, to wrap it up. Um, so I'll speak to Councillor Bolton's amendment and then propose mine and if I have a seconder, perhaps. Sure. Um, so would you like to speak to Councillor Bolton's amendment and we can vote on that and then you can put your amendment afterwards? Actually, um, could I do it the other way around? Because I'd like it th as a package. And um, you're not concerned that it might not be... Um, the, the two things together might not be acceptable, but a meeting afterwards would be, is my suggestion. I'd prefer one to vote separately. You'd want yeah. to vote separately? Yeah. Yeah. Okay, one all right. Minute. Okay, so if you'd like to speak to Councillor Bolton's amendment, which was to have a meeting before we adopt the scorecard, do that now. Yes. We'll go to the vote and then you can put your amendment. Okay. Thank you. Um, I've heard my fellow councillors speak, um, and I don't think that there can be any harm done by going out to the public um, and those, those committee groups that we have spoken to are a select group of people and they have involved um, the members of the community. But I think having um, a broader meeting um, and notifying people who wish to attend is something that is our responsibility and something that I would encourage people to come along to. There is no harm in doing that. Um, if this is voted on today, the trial will go ahead. And then after the 12 months, Hopefully those people who came along to that meeting and more people who are now further aware of these proposals are able to see, um, hopefully, the greater results that this produces for um, developments in our area. So my main reasoning is that there is no harm that can come from inviting people along to better understand this. Yes, people should get involved with council, but I, I sit on council and I feel a responsibility to go out myself, and many, many councillors do that. So it's about bringing people along for the journey, and there's no harm that can come from doing that. Thank you, Councillor Davidson. Is there anyone else who'd like to speak to Councillor Bolton's amendment? No? I'm going to put that... Oh, just the, the almost. <laughs> <laughs> sorry, sorry, sorry. I just want to speak so that everyone knows um, where I stand. So I agree with um, the statement of Councillor Davidson, and I feel that um, whilst we have been talking about it and those that have been actively engaged have been following this scorecard closely. Not all of the residents have had the same opportunities. Thank you, Councillor Carleyannon. I'm now going to put Councillor Bolton's amendment to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Uh, declare the amendment, the proposed amendment lost. Um, Councillor Davidson, would you like to record it? Yep. So all those against Councillor Bolton's amendment to hold a meeting before <coughs> the scorecard. Against? Uh, against the amendment. Sorry, I've gone backwards. <laughs> yeah, that's all right. So, Councillor Martin, Kavanagh, Farnley, Abood and Riley. I'm glad I don't have the typing job over there in the corner. And all those for the amendment? Sorry. <laughs> Councillor Tapanos. Councillor Davidson, Councillor Carly Hannon, and Councillor Bolton. 
So I will declare that the proposed amendment has been lost and well, I'll now ask Councillor Bolton if you, uh, sorry, Councillor Davidson, if you would like to put your proposed amendment to the mover and seconder. Yes, That's please. My, my proposed amendment is that um, there is a meeting after the trial period that invites the public to attend. That's acceptable that's to me as the mover. Yes, yeah, so um, prior to the final adoption. Yes. Yeah. After the trial. Yeah, after the trial, but yes, prior to prior the, to yeah. the yeah. final adoption. Yes, thank yeah, you. That's, that's acceptable. Yes. Yeah. Yep. So I'll just wait till you've got the words down for that. So Councillor Davidson's amendment, proposed amendment is that we run a public meeting after the completion of the 12 month trial before we adopt um, the scorecard. Now, um, Councillor Davidson, I'll ask you to speak to the amendment. Um, my it's reasons. It's been oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's been accepted. Yeah, yeah sorry. So you, you don't, don't need to. to. Okay. Um, Councillor, so that That's now becomes incorporated in part of the substantive motion. Mm -hmm. And what we need to do is speak to the substantive motion. I've heard from the seconder. Um, I believe Councillor Kavanagh has reserved his right to close the debate. And Councillor Tapanos, you'd like to say something? I, I, no, I would like to propose an amendment. No. Um, uh, also been circulated over email. Um, I think it might be on... So that's to add an additional dot point to read, amend the design excellence scorecard to only permit planning applications to use the new streamlined scorecard process if they meet the Moreland planning scheme and stay within the existing height limits listed in the structure plans and DDOs, which are the design and development overlays. And so I need to ask the mover and seconder if that's acceptable? No. Uh, no. Second. Okay, can you just hold on a second? Councillor Davidson, can you just clarify the words of your amendment? So just through the mayor, we just need to pause for a moment because they were that was a proposal um, in live time. So we just need to be able to get your um, the amendment in before we can move on to Councillor Tapanos's proposal. Okay. So in condition number one adopts the design. No, it's, no, it's, it's, it's, it's an extra. Oh, it's an, sorry, that's all right. An extra point to say. Um, following as point number six, um, following the trial period, um, council will arrange a public meeting prior to the proposed adoption. Perhaps final adoption. The final, sorry, the final adoption of the um, design excellence scorecard. Thank you. Okay, so Councillor Tapanos, have you circulated your proposed amendment? Yep. yep. I'm not checking emails after it's 7 p.m. because I'm checking. Thank you. Yep, that's okay. I don't have time to read that. Now. Yes. And Councillor Bolton has agreed to second uh, the proposed amendment. So, Councillor Tapanos, um, would you like to speak to your proposed Thank amendment? You. Thank you. I think this is a really important one. Um, I, for many years, have been concerned about excessive heights in our city, and I know that this whole council has. For 10 years, we've been running a campaign to change one word in our planning scheme, and that is the word mandatory. Many times in the Urban Planning Committee, and now Planning Matters Committee, we have stood firm on rejecting excessive heights in our city, and that's the right thing to do. But I am concerned with this scorecard process. And why I'm concerned is because I know what it will do, what the outcome would be. It will trade off heights for good design. And I like to say on good design, it's very subjective. Who says, who determines what is good design, what is of excellence? It's very subjective. I know many planning applicants, every planning applicant would say their development is good design, good quality design. But I know what the reality is on the ground. 
The reality is that the development world will come in and seek more and more heights, seeking to trade off heights for good design. I say, why can't we have both? Why can't we have good design and stay within the height limits that our community has agreed to through proper consultation? This sends a strong message. We want good design. Yes, we want those additional things, but we want you to stay within our planning height controls. Slowly, slowly, we would send the development world a message. If we approve this, we would say, the sky's the limit on heights, as long as you give us ticks and boxes on a scorecard. And I don't want to go there again. I think it would set a bad, bad precedence. And a year, a year can do a lot of damage because we all know that in planning, it's all about precedence. So a couple of these big developments get approved on Sydney Road, on Ligon Street, that's there forever. And it will be a reference point for every other development to say, they got so many stories, why can't I? Councillors, we need to stick to our policy of, of, of height control limits. We need to make sure that they are mandatory and send a strong message to the development world. This will undo that. I just want to talk a little bit about one of the key experiences I've had on this council, and that's going back to 2010, when we had 14 stories approved under delegation by town planners on Albert Street. None of the councillors took responsibility. It wasn't our decision. It was an officer decision. Of course, the officer felt that it had good design. That's why they approved it. They wouldn't have done so otherwise. That's why I say, who makes the call? Who makes the call that 14 stories is OK if you tick the boxes on the scorecard? It's unacceptable to me to take away that power from councillors and from the community. Ching, ching, ching. Um, uh, since then, we've amended the delegations to say anything over structure plan heights must come to council. We've taken back control. This is going backwards. So Thank I you, urge Councillor councillors Tappanos. to support this amendment. Councillor Bolton is the seconder of this amendment, proposed amendment. Yes, I think it's good that this amendment has been proposed. I think um, it is uh, concerning that there's no mention about heights as part of their good design scorecard because... Um, Surely heights have an, uh, are one part of the good design package. Um, we know that heights can have major impacts on the amenity of next door neighbours. Um, I think since I've been on the Urban Planning Committee, now called Planning and Other Matters Committee, what I notice is the practice of most of the development applications is um, for the developers to offer sweeteners to council. We'll do this good little bit if you allow us to build several storeys above the height limit. Now, because we do have the safety valve of some of the um, applications coming to council, to, uh, to the Planning and Other Matters Committee, it means that sometimes we can bring those heights down. Um, we don't succeed in every case, um, and sometimes it might not come down right to the height limits, but there are a number of cases where the councillors have voted to bring the heights down um, to uh, in support of the community when the community feels that um, the heights are just really, really negative. Um, so I feel that in some ways um, this good design scorecard without the safety valve, because really that's what it is, it's the safety valve of being of um, residents um, pushing for these applications to come before the Planning and Other Matters Committee, um, then this is, will set this practice in stone. And I think you always, in any kind of process, you need a safety valve because it doesn't matter how wonderful a council officer may be, um, there's always a, a different perspective by a person who's living next door to um, a particular development. And, and there are aspects um, that the resident who's actually living in the neighbourhood will pick up on that um, a planner or a councillor may not um, really fully appreciate. So I think we always need some sort of safety valve. And I, in particular, am concerned by developers trying to offer these little sweeteners in order to persuade councillors to go above the height limits. The height limits were, were consulted on for years and years and years. And I think democracy has to mean something. Public consultation has to mean something. So I, I do think um, 
developers should only be considered for the good design uh, scorecard if they comply with the height limits. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, I've got Councillor Kavanagh next and then Councillor Riley. Um, I want to speak against the motion. Can I say that when mandatory height limits have come up to this council in the entire time I've been on council, I have supported mandatory height controls. We've been refused by the minister each and every time. Each and every time. If this resolution is successful, the only applicants that will be subject to mandatory height controls will be ones that actually reach the design uh, excellence that we want. They will be the only ones. No one else will be. So, yes, I want mandatory height controls, but why would we put mandatory height controls only on the best applications and not on the worst applications? Mm. That makes no sense. I'm sorry, that makes no sense. Regarding Albert Street, I'm disappointed that's been raised tonight. Mm -hmm. That's not fair to our officers. I'll say about Albert Street. That was advertised, that application. At that stage, the delegation rights were 10 or more objectives. We had, although it was advertised widely, not one objection. Then, it, then officers put it to councillors at a briefing, a briefing that all members of the UPC were invited to, and two councillors turned up, myself and Councillor Canellan. They said, we've had no objections in this. It's been widely advertised, showed us the advertising, and they said, what, what do you want us to do? We've got delegation rights. Do you want to override that or not? Yes, it's a bad choice. When the councillor says that no councillor takes responsibility, I take responsibility, but I think the councillors who don't attend briefings should also take responsibility for not being at the briefing. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Riley, would you like to speak? Yep, thank you. Um, don't mention the wall. <laughs> don't mention heights, because that's what this is about. The, this amendment is, I think, somewhat disingenuous. The whole principle of the Design Excellence Scorecard is to ensure that it complies with the planning scheme and all of the other provisions that we've got laid down. This is implying through this that we're not going to um, meet the more on planning scheme, stay within the existing height limits and the structure plans and the GDOs. That's exactly what the report that we've just uh, received this evening has um, stipulated that it's going to do that, but it's also going to draw out these other excellent aspects. If you're talking about trade-offs, if you're talking about sweeteners, and you're talking about safety valves, the whole principle of our planning scheme is based on this negotiable aspects of, um, you know, whether it's height, how big the footprint is, the setback, the amount of environmental sustainable design you have as opposed to how much light you let in and all sorts of things. Everything is completely kind of tradable and negotiable. So talk about trade-offs and sweeteners. And we cop it all the time because of, because of that. And we have to deal with it at the Urban Planning Committee. It's been set up by Jeff Kennett's Liberal government and been adopted by the ALP ever since. They love it. They keep... And they won't change it. We just had an election and nobody, everyone thought the ALP government was fantastic. We'll have them back, thanks. We don't we want, need to reform our planning scheme. This is not what this is about. This is about trying to in, induce really good aspects of design. And I think by highlighting these, it's actually disingenuous. It's, it's claiming that, in fact, we're not going to do this. We are going to do this. The fact is we have preferred height limits and we try and stick to those. And sometimes um, we, we may approve as councils or officers or as a UPC. We might go one or two stories beyond the preferred height if it gives some other amenity, which is that trade-off that you're talking about, the sweetener that has been mentioned. So I, I think um, that is a process that happens in our planning scheme now. I don't know. That, I don't think this is going to make that any more difficult than it already is. Um, the issue of uh, height is something that's very sensitive to us as councillors and officers and to our community, and I'm sure it would come up in the process of the discussion and debate. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Um, I'd just like to make some comments as well. Um, I won't be supporting this last minute amendment from Councillor Tapanos. Um, one, because I haven't had a chance to read it because it wasn't sent before I sat down to chair the meeting, which I think would be um, irresponsible of me, but also because I feel like this piece of work, um, from my perspective and my involvement, has had a lot, a huge amount of, of in, invested time from officers. It hasn't just been banged together to fit into last Wednesday's agenda. Um, it has some very uh, detailed benchmarks for stuff that we would really like to see on all of the developments that are happening in the city. So it's 
more carrot, less stick. We've tried stick, stick doesn't work. Stick, stick goes to VCAT, lawyer gets paid. We come back with a crappy development in the city, which has the height and has all of, none of this scorecard stuff that we're trying to achieve. Um, I reject the idea of setting a precedent because the city is not full of 13 storey buildings like the one that exists in Albert Street. And I reject the idea of the safety valve because the scorecard is the safety valve. If we put the height limits on it, what we end up with is nothing. And at the moment, what we have is we, is we exceed heights and we have bad outcomes. This is a scenario where there may be the odd development that's one or two storeys now, one or two storeys higher, which at the moment most of them are, via VCAT or whatever, but this would have some really serious outcomes so that people I know who need to be on a wheelchair can get into most of these buildings. People I know who want to have solar panels can live in most of these buildings. Like, the thing goes on forever. I'm assuming that this report has been read and there's absolutely no way whatsoever I would support slapping heights on it because I think it makes the whole thing null and void. Because height, mandatory height controls has never worked. We haven't had the planning minister in this city for four years to talk about height. So throwing heights on it means throwing the whole thing in the bin, in my opinion, and I won't be supporting the amendment to put the height restriction on it. Councillor Martin? Um, thanks. I, I also will be um, speaking against this amendment. If, if we're talking here, and what we're talking about is height, and everyone's um, very jumpy at height um, in this city, if we're talking about an exceptional development and the difference between it being financially viable and not being half a foot. If a building is half a foot over the DDO, then I, I am more than happy to approve that building. What we currently have in the current situation is 20 applications a year come to council and we refuse them. We refuse a lot of applications if you've watched any of the urban planning committee meetings. And then what happens is it goes to VCAT and we lose. And it's almost always over the height limit. That is the current system. We can continue the current system if you would like us to continue the current status quo. But what we're doing here, and, and who determines it? The scorecard determines it. Quantifiable figures and numbers in the scorecard. So I hope my fellow councillors have read the report. The little sweeteners, the little sweeteners that we're talking about are people in a wheelchair being able to find a rental property? They're people who are looking for an affordable house. These are the little sweeteners that we're talking about for potentially a story, a floor over the DDO. If by the end of this year, we have one or two buildings that have gone through this process and those definable characteristics and those little sweeteners are included in those developments, and we've given away an extra floor or two, then I am more than happy with this process. And I really hope that if that is the outcome, that we continue this into the future. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Thank you. Are there any other councillors that would like to speak to Councillor Tapanos's amendment? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour of Councillor Tapanos's amendment? Against? I declare that lost. Councillor Bolton, would you like that recorded? Oh, yeah, you could do. Great, let's have that recorded. So all those in favour of Councillor Tapanos's amendment? In favour? <laughs> Councillor Bolton, oh, Councillor Tapanos? All those against? Everyone else. Everyone else. So we'll just give those people who are typing a chance to catch up. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And Councillor Riley. Oh. And Councillor Riley. Excellent. Thank you. So I now return to the substantive motion with just that one amendment which came from Councillor Davidson about having a town hall meeting at the end of the trial to before we finalise adoption of the scorecard. And I'd like to, are you speaking against the motion? No, in favour. Okay. Is against. anyone like to speak against, because I've had someone for, Councillor um, no, Kavanagh no, no. has reserved his right against, against. Councillor Tapanos. Thank you. Um, 
Uh, don't get me wrong, there's a lot of benefits into having a scorecard and aiming, as we all do, for better design outcomes in our city. But this is not the right way. The right way to go about it is to actually change the planning laws and enshrine those changes in planning legislation. It's a long process, it's a difficult one, and the Minister has blocked us in the past. But slowly, slowly, we have made progressive change for the better, and that's the process we should follow. Incentivising and trading things off is not the way. Make no mistake what this does tonight. It, it removes the rights of residents to have a say through their representatives, us, the councillors. It means on a planning process that's gone through to tick these boxes, residents won't be able to lobby councillors, to influence councillors in decision making, to have their councillors make a decision in an open democratic forum like we have today. And more importantly, it won't allow the right of residents to hold their councillors responsible when elections come for the decisions that they've made. These decisions will be made behind closed doors by planning officers. Um, that is not democracy, that is not how the system should work, and that is not the principle that I think Moreland should undertake in order to get some additional benefits. It's not the right process. Secondly, um, I know what the outcome is going to be. It's trading heights, because that's what developers want. They want heights and they want removal of red tape. It's trading heights in particular to, to tick the boxes and get some more solar panels and some more additional um, benefits. Um, and I need to remind you that um, over the last seven or eight years, after the Albert Street um, approval by town planners, um, we changed the planning delegations. We said, as a council, that anything that was above structure plan heights should come to the council. And I'll tell you what that did. We took control back of planning. We sent a strong message to the development world that Moreland was serious about heights. The developers, they were like, Moreland, yep, if they say five, apply for ten. And they were getting ten. We changed the game. We changed the message and they listened. Yes, they applied for one or two extra and sometimes they got it and they got it at VCAT. But we didn't get this notion of the sky's the limit. Moreland was serious about heights. Today, we changed the planning delegation um, and we don't have those applications coming to council. We sent the wrong message. We send the message that the sky's the limit, put up a solar panel, put some additional benefits and ask for five, ten, whatever you want and you will get it. Well, that's not right and it's going to lead to bad outcomes and I just want to put that on the record. I think it's going to lead to terrible outcomes, even within Thank the you, space Councillor of the Tappanos. year. Uh, Councillor Afani. Thank you. Councillors, I rise to speak in favour of the, um, of the motion. Uh, since coming to Council, I've been working really, really hard to fix some of the planning issues that have been raised even tonight by Gary, I know Joe's in the audience as well. Some of those planning issues that get raised constantly are over development in medium density areas like Faulkner, like Oak Park, like Glenroy, like Pasco Park. Some of the other issues that get raised is the quality of the high density buildings that are going up in our city. They're dog boxes, they're tiny, they're not accessible, they're not green. Those are the issues that residents are raising and tonight, this motion is seeking to address the issues raised in regards to the quality of the buildings. That's what the whole purpose of this is. And I know in good faith, I'm not going to be moving any changes to this report regarding overdevelopment because I believe that we'll be addressing that issue through a separate, separate report. But in regards to this report, uh, the Design Excellence Scorecard, what it's actually trying to do is say to developers, if you bring forward a development, that you retain the original architect throughout the building until the project completion, you have a rooftop with open communal spaces, you have high energy rating, 7.5 star, and that occurs for uh, buildings with high density. If it's substantially improving the pedestrian environment, then I don't need to see the development. Council officers with qualified planning applications can deal with it. Residents still have the right to engage through planning information discussion meetings, 
engage the developer, engage planning officers, engage councillors. Councillors can all join the meetings that get put forward uh, in planning information discussion meetings. There's absolutely nothing that changes other than the final decision because the developer has actually brought forward a substantially high quality design is the high qualified planning application uh, planning officer can approve it. That's the only difference. So some of the discussion tonight saying that you know the world's going to fall over is vastly overstated. Hardly any developer is actually going to come forward with this type of development because it costs them money. <laughs> but what we're trying to do is say, hey, if you have a high quality building that you will have that you want to put forward, then we've got a, this design excellence process that you can engage in. That's the only change. So they still have to comply with the Moreland Planning Scheme on heights. They still have to comply with every other planning scheme on all other um, rules that we have in play. But if they bring forward a high quality application, then they'll be able to uh, move ahead and work with planning officers. We'll deal with the overdevelopment of medium density through other formats. But uh, in regards to this format for high density development, I'm quite supportive of what we have here. Thank you, Councillor Farnley. Councillor Bolton. Um, Councillor Davidson uh, said earlier in the discussion that this proposal, which is a major proposal, has only been consulted with, um, with small groups of people, select groups, because a lot of it is committees, round tables. I went to one of those round tables and there was only a single solitary resident. There might have been some other round tables they didn't get to, but um, it had industry representatives, but only a single solitary re resident. Um, with this proposal, we, you know, one of the other councillors has said tonight that um, the planning scheme, um, all of the different elements of the planning scheme are tradable. Will anything, will any of these elements be tradable under this good design scorecard? I think we are trading off quite a major thing, which is residents' rights um, to be able to have a say. So yes, people will be able to attend the PIDs. Yes, I'll be able to contact a councillor. Yes, I'll be able to contact a council officer. But if the council officer approves a development and it has a major impact on their amenity, how many people are going to be able to afford to spend $3,000 to go to VCAT or $300 for a pensioner? I mean, it basically means people who are well healed, the wealthy class, will be able to um, challenge these applications at VCAT, but ordinary people on low incomes will not have those same rights. And yes, sometimes a developer might say, you know, I've got a good development, we just want to go half a metre above the height limit. I know I've seen applications like that. But we also know the developers who try to go three, four, five storeys above the height limit. It's not all just half a metre. I know with that Albert Street development, which I wasn't on council at that time, my understanding from uh, the people who... That, was, that development was the reason why the Brunswick Residence Network was formed. I gather the signs... Uh, alerting the community development were around the back of the building where no one walked and it was lodged, they were put up on Christmas Eve. That's why no one objected. People didn't know about that development. Council generally doesn't control where developers put the signs. Um, uh, you know, the developers put them where they want to put them. And yeah, so that's a reason why no one objected to that building. I mean, I've heard that from people in the Brunswick Residence Network. I, I think we, I, I'm certainly concerned that we haven't gone out to the community with a proper consultation on this, so that the community in a broad sense know about this proposal. I think this is a major change, and I think it should, you know, I, I think we do want good design, we Thank do want Council more Wilson. affordable housing and other good things, but I don't think we should trade off residents' rights. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Carly Hannon. Okay. Um, so I rise to speak in favour of the Design Excellence Scorecard. A lot of things have already been mentioned tonight, so I won't touch on a lot of those. But I wanted to speak specifically around 
the idea of community benefit and of affordability. So when it comes to a lot of these designs, what we're talking about here is actually making homes that are livable, that are sustainable. And what that means for real people is that they can actually ensure that their electricity and their gas bills are not through the roof, that they can ensure that their families can stay living in areas with public transport and good services. If you look at Brunswick, it's not becoming an affordable area. And when we talk about good development, we have it here in our scorecard, what we actually want to see. So we've already spoken about what small numbers we're discussing here and the kind of applications that are going to have to come forward for us to actually be able to approve it. The reality is that the kind of locations that these developments may be seen are going to be in the activity centre. They're going to be along those corridors like the train lines and the areas that we're already seeing this kind of development occur. And as we've already mentioned, we're not seeing it at the moment because we haven't got all those incentives and things that we've talked about to actually make these applications financially viable and achievable for developers. So we actually are seeing some, some good development in Moreland, I have to say, and we saw that at the end of last year. And we have to acknowledge the stuff that we actually want to see being built in our city. And in order to do that, we need to create a system that tells them exactly what we want. It doesn't muck around. We're not playing politics with people. We're not playing politics with people's lives. Like, yes, we can talk about the developers and the things we don't like about them, but let's talk about the residents who are actually going to live in these homes. Thank you. Thank you, Liv. Are there any other councillors who'd like to speak to this motion? Uh, just before you do, um, yes. Councillor Kavanagh, yeah. um, I just wanted to... Well, I wanted to commend Councillor Afanli for his well-considered comments because I know that he's been engaged with the whole project and I think that most of us have been and that's a really important part of what has been presented in this report. Um, so I just want to stress again that there has been a huge amount of work behind this, but also just to point out... Um, something that Liv said, which is the buildings are going to be built, built anyway. So the buildings are going to be built without any of these credentials. They're going to be built. Possibly they're going to be two storeys higher than we want them to be. Because what happens is the application comes in at 10, we say, oh, we prefer six, and the developers say, okay, we'll settle with eight, which is what they wanted in the first place. The height, the detail, these buildings will be built and they have been built. And they've been built without the credentials that we're after. And we have a responsibility to the city to, within as much control of we, as we have, and Councillor Tapanos has pointed out what little control we have with the planning department, to manage this huge number of applications and buildings that are being built in the city. So I think that adopting the scorecard is the most responsible thing to do. I think the fact that it's got a 12-month trial and we've agreed that um, a town hall meeting and before we lock it in is a really great um, amendment and I have no qualms about, and I hope other councillors would also see that this is a great thing to accept. Councillor Kavanagh? Well, just very briefly, because I know it's been a long debate, but I must say I think it's been an excellent debate, so uh, well done, councillors. Um, just a couple of quick points. Number one, let's say it's an average of 1,600 applications a year. Sometimes we get 1,500, sometimes 1,800. Of those 1,600 applications, 1,570 councillors don't get to see. There is no PID, councillors don't get to see those 1,570 applications a year. Of those 1,570 applications, I would estimate, and I'm only guessing, that in structure plan, in, in the structured areas, there's probably 200 to 250 of those 1,570. So those, those ones that we don't get to see have, are not exceeding the height controls. That's why we don't get to see them. Councillor Tapanos is correct. The delegation changed and so therefore we don't get to see those. So yes, there are some that are exceeding the height controls, most are not. Secondly, he mentioned the fact about uh, councillors being responsible at election time. I've stood for three re-elections now. At every single one of those, people have criticised me for approving applications I've never seen. They're obviously part of the 1,570. Do you actually think that every resident actually knows which decisions were made under delegation and which were made by councillors? Of course they don't. They see the overall development in the city and they hold us accountable as they should. That's exactly how it should be. They are unaware as to whether those decisions have been made under delegation or not. If this is approved, there'll be five, hopefully four or five applications a year that people will at least get more say than what the 1,570 are getting because they'll get a PID and they'll get information at that time. 
they'll still be getting more consultation than the vast majority of applications. And as well as that, we'll be getting positive outcomes, not just a bit of design, improvements in four key areas and exemplary improvements. As I said before, we've set the bar high. I said high jump, more like a pole vault. We've set the bar high. And maybe it's so high that developers will say, to save six weeks of application, it's not worth it. I hope they do think it's worth it, because at least we'll see some, app, some development that is of excellence. And I think, in all honesty, we have different views around the table, but I think that's one thing we all have in common. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. So, since Councillor Kavanagh has closed the debate on this item, I'll put it to the vote. All those in favour? Against? And can that be recorded, please? So, all those in favour? Thank you. And against? And I declare that carried. Okay. Thank you for your work back there with prompt typing. It was challenging. Democracy in action. The next report we have to consider this evening is DCD 119, <coughs> Friends of Aleu, invitation to Aleu, Aleu Municipal Secretary to visit Melbourne in May 2019. <coughs> one to come up earlier than Newlands. I'll just go with oh, this okay. since I've just announced it. Um, do I have a mover for this motion, DCD 119? Councillor Bolton and a seconder. Councillor Carly Hannon. Councillor Bolton, would you like to talk to the motion? I, um, th this is a motion to invite the Mayor of Alu, which is a part of East Timor, that um, a, a municipality in East Timor, which Moreland has had a relationship for around 10 years now. Um, so, you know, it's not only Moreland, it's Hume Council as well. So the two of us have been uh, working together with LU um, on various um, sorts of development projects and so forth. And they've been um, students and representatives of the local um, council in LU come and visit us in uh, Moreland and Hume. And so this is furthering this work. Um, a number of councils uh, at the time of the East Timor re uh, independence referendum, a number of councils in Australia formed relationships with small uh, municipalities within East Timor, um, especially because um, Australia was implicated in some of the terrible things that happened in, in East Timor, and particularly the taking of their oil. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Carly Hannon. Any uh, councillors like to speak against this motion? Uh, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. So, could we bring the new ones one up? Sure. I did the photocopy one. So, I'd, I'd like to bring forward DCF 519. Traffic safety on Newlands Road, Coburg North, response to notice of motion. Councillor Bolton. I'd like to uh, move the resolution with two um, extra points, which I circulated. So, um, a point uh, five. To write it down actually. Um, a point for. Uh, we can screen. Screen. Put it back up. Yeah, point five to conduct community consultation about an adequate pedestrian crossing at the roundabout on Newlands Road, and secondly, advocate to Vic Roads for a speed reduction for the residential section of Newlands Road. Uh, and if I have a second, then I'll speak to it. So, is anybody seconding Councillor Bolton's? You got a question? Um, I just a question with point five of, of Councillor Bolton's the community consultation about an uh, what what is the you want to conduct community consultation with it with a view with a view to um, installing an adequate pedestrian crossing. I wasn't. 
remove the word adequate and say install on your pedestrian crossing. Yeah. I, I would like a little bit more information from officers um, in regards to the, the... I'm not familiar with the, um, the current process and whether or not this is jumping... I mean, we did hear from one of the residents. Oh. Okay, we're not debating the amendments. Um, I've got a question about advocating to Vic Roads for a speed reduction with regard to the intentions of the MITs, which has not been... Um, yeah, thank you. Uh, just through the Mayor. So I'll just put a couple of bits of info on the table and then a possible way forward. Um, so uh, you would have seen from the officer report um, the commentary around speed limits and the types of things that can happen there are really um, related a lot to the kind of road it is in the road hierarchy. Um, and so that's where some of the commentary about um, not being able to drop speeds and some of those issues are there. Um, my suggestion to Council would be um, if there is not a time requirement that you consider deferring the report because those two points are quite substantial and so it would be worth deferring the report to then consider them you know, out of the chamber and then resubmitting in the next council meeting. Councillor Riley. I'm happy to move. I was considering doing that after hearing that advice. I'm more than happy, particularly with the input from residents this evening, to actually defer it so we actually get some clarity. I think there's quite a bit of detail in the report and it'd be good to work through it rather than try and do it on the floor tonight. So I'd like to move a deferral. Um, the motion doesn't have... to have a deferral. Yep, OK. So all those in favour of a deferral? Against, I declare that deferred. Uh, Councillor Bolton, I'm assuming that you probably want to move to um, your notice of motion, which is about the printing. I think it's okay because I think the residents have had the leave. So okay, thank you. Right. So we'll just return back to the agenda as it's written. Uh, the next item is DBT 119, the Australian Citizenship Ceremonies Code Review 2019. Yeah, I'd like to move a, a slight alternative to the um, council officer's recommendation. Thank you. And, uh, One, two, three, four, five. It's the, the amendment is... Oh, I think that was the one. Oh. The amendment adds a few words to uh, point two, which was circulated a little earlier, and I'll highlight that. If I have a second, I'll be happy to speak to it. I'm happy to second that. Uh, to uh, give an overview of this uh, report, this is um, the Australian Government is conducting a review to the Australian Citizenship Ceremonies Code, uh, and the Moreland City Council is providing some feedback on that. Some of those changes are that um, uh, not to support an amendment to have a federal member uh, read out the <coughs> minister's message, as traditionally that's been reserved for the mayor. Um, also that uh, not to support ha must having the citizenship on September 17, as um, council likes having those midweek. Um, uh, not to support um, having to schedule them dependent on federal or state parliament sitting dates that restricts the amount of citizenship ceremonies that can be conducted. And, um, and the slight amendment I uh, have arranged for point number two addresses the point that uh, to reflect council's position that January 26 uh, is not uh, referred to as Australia Day or a celebration as Australia Day. Uh, however, we will continue to conduct citizenship ceremonies on that date. Um, thank you, Councillor Afanli. Um, as the second, uh, seconder, I'd like to speak to this motion as well. Um, and I want to commend the officers um, and those councillors who engaged with the consultation about what we wanted to feed back into these changes because um, I think it's been really well reflected uh, in this report about what everybody actually said. Um, as the councillor who presided over the January 26 Australia Day ceremony, um, I can report that it was a great opportunity for me as mayor to um, be able to relay the story of the First Nations people in this place um, to those new residents who are coming to live in the city who understand very uh, closely what displacement and loss of culture and language can feel like. So even though I was a little bit nervous at the beginning when I had to consider as the mayor that I would have to do that ceremony, it was a beautiful, a beautiful day. And I think that the citizenship ceremony is... Um, I'm speaking to the 
the uh, dress code where, when I say that it's something that happens ideally once in a person's life if they go through this thing. And the pride and, um, you know, excitement that people feel and the way they dress in my mind should never have even been considered. Um, I've had photos with some people that I know are absolutely thrilled to be, uh, you know, be able to celebrate uh, and they show that by the way they dress. So I'm, I can't imagine there would be an issue with people's clothing on this day. But with regard to the timing of the ceremonies, <clears throat> while I understand that um, there is some importance about September 17, I believe it is, and, and the fact that that's called Citizenship Day, uh, it clashes potentially with council requirements. Um, we have lots of meetings scheduled through the year. We have um, you know, a meeting every two weeks in this chamber and we have weekly um, Monday night briefings and a lot of us are on committees that mean we have many extra meetings as well. And I think that being able to accommodate federal members, while I understand why they want to be here for ceremony because I want to be here too, um, is not always going to work. And so I, I think that um, it's worth acknowledging that the feedback into this important piece of work Oh, well, this piece of work that was put to us um, has been very well considered and I'm, I'm proud to be seconding it and look forward to next Tuesday's citizenship ceremony, actually. Are there any councillors who'd like to speak against the motion and for the motion? John? Yeah, I'm going to speak for the motion. Uh, I suppose more, mine uh, is just more general. I'm sure any former mayor uh, will tell you that it's one of the most uh, joyous experiences of their term. And, and even at times when I'm not the mayor, I still think it's a magnificent event. And I think if everyone in the community was able to attend those and to see the joy on new, the uh, uh, citizens' faces and their absolute unbridled enthusiasm, I think it would be really beneficial to Australia, to be honest, because it's just magnificent. I too, like uh, the mayor, was surprised that there was any need in the document to talk about standards of dress because frankly, I think that the way people dress at citizenship ceremonies is magnificent and I've never thought otherwise. Um, I also must say that I do think Moreland do citizenship ceremonies particularly well. I have visited some others and uh, they're, they're not as good and they're not as welcoming, I don't think. I think we do it exceptionally well. And so I congratulate our officers and I congratulate councillors and the mayors for a number of years. I think, you know, people feel as if they have been valued and that we are in joining with them on what is one of the most important days of their life. And I just briefly, I had one incident, a very last citizenship ceremony I was doing, there was a lady who was having a photo with me and her father was having a photo and he said, uh, he's from India. And I said, uh, oh yes, my sister-in-law's from India, she's from Kerala. He said, oh, I'm from Kerala. He said, but I'm from India. I flew in at four o'clock this afternoon and I fly out midnight tonight. I wanted to see my, my daughter's citizenship. And so he'd flown from India to come to the citizenship ceremony. Just fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Are there any other councillors that would like to speak to this motion? Uh, if there are no further speakers, I'll put this item to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried unanimously. I now move to EMF, thank you, Nick. 119, first right of refusal process for sale of Victrack site at 3... 31 Barclay Street, Brunswick. Councillor Riley's on his feet. Yeah, I'd just like to move this one. This is a, um, a sale of land from Victrack. And um, whilst I often get up and complain about the disposal of our um, land, taxpayer-owned land um, and that council should have to pick it up, um, and I, I am going to do that at this point. I've already just said that because I don't think <laughs> ratepayers should have to pay for public space. But in this case, there's a little bit of warmth and joy in my heart because... Uh, Councillor Raleigh, I need a second back. Oh, thank you. Sorry. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Um, so just briefly, I just want to celebrate the fact that this is going to um, see potentially release uh, some land on the western side of uh, um, Jewel Station, uh, where there's been for decades uh, residents have worked to, to populate that park with trees and shrubbery and to keep it looking great. And there's a huge development going up on the east side and we're going to need that space more and more. So this is uh, potentially leading to some more acquisition of open space, which we've done up at um, Outlook Drive and along the, the Many Ponds Creek. We've had to spend a lot of money. This is hopefully not such a large amount of money, but something that we should be able to manage within 
um, reasonable, hopefully reasonably within our budget. So I'm rather excited about the fact that we might actually get this. This is just to get the process going so that you will be consulted as citizens and as uh, ratepayers about what happens with this land. Um, and hopefully one day governments will stop having to make another government pay for land that we already own as citizens. But um, meanwhile, we're going to keep this nonsense going, so I'm happy for us to do it. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Councillor Bolton? Oh, um, just short and sweet, I think uh, any acquisition of land for um, green open space, um, in particular in the most dense areas of um, our municipality, is a very good thing. So I heartily recommend this uh, resolution. I think it's um, great. Um, there's um, there are just far too few parks in our most densely populated areas. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Are there any councillors that would like to speak against this motion? No. Uh, in, the, in that case, I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. I'll now move to uh, DCD 219, uh, Disability Access to Stores and Venues, Response to Notice of Motion, uh, NOM 4818. Councillor uh, Martin. Thank you. I'm, I'd like to move a deferral of this, uh, this report. Thank you. Didn't have a second. Reason? Don't um, need a reason. <laughs> I'm happy to. Yeah. I'm, I'm um, happy to give a reason if um, <coughs> if I'm permitted. You are the one to the um, the, the rationale for deferring this is that um, I believe this report um, needs quite uh, a bit more work. Um, there's also uh, many members of the community that have contacted me um, that would like us to explore other um, options as well. And I think um, doing this and moving amendments um, at such short notice. Um, is in good practice, and I think we need to work with officers a little bit more on this one. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Uh, put the deferral proposal to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. De declare that deferred, I should say. Uh, the next, I'd like to welcome Councillor Yildiz to the chamber. Um, the next item is DCF 419, pedestrian safety issues at laneway adjacent to 185 Moreland Road, Coburg, response to notice of motion 3618. Councillor Farnley? I'd like to move the council officer's recommendation. Thank you, Councillor Farnley. A seconder? Councillor Martin? Councillor Farnley, would you like to speak to the motion? Um, <clears throat> it's a unique yank laneway because uh, people's front doors actually open up right onto the laneway, so it's not like any other laneway that I'm aware of in Moreland. Um, I've had uh, some just consultation with the resident that was um, Concern and um, uh, she's uh, read the report and um, the only question that uh, uh, she had was how quickly can the signage go up and I believe that was answered it was going to be within a few months from the uh, direction so if this is adopted uh, it will be weeks, a few weeks, fantastic. So if this is adopted, look forward to seeing that go out and see how that changes the uh, safety on the mainway. Thank you, Councillor. Finally, Councillor Martin, would you like to speak to this motion? No, thank you. Anyone like to speak against this motion? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. We've already seen DCF 519, which has been deferred, so I'll move on to EMF 219. Discontinuance and sale of right-of-way adjoining 5 Mackay, Mackay Street, Brunswick. Uh, do I have a mover for this report? Councillor Riley and a seconder? Well, I'm happy to I'm second. second. Oh, thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. So, Councillor Riley and Councillor Kavanagh. Uh, Councillor Riley, would you like to speak to the motion? Uh, yeah, I'm happy to move the um, officer's report um, as stated. This is um, a, a bit of an anomaly for this uh, resident in terms of the alignment of their property and the actual boundaries. So, um, it will actually rectify a bit of an outstanding problem so they'll be able to actually own the wall that they have currently got on public land. So it'll um, write, write a bit of a mistake um, that's been historical. So I think it's a good move. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Uh, Councillor Kavanagh, would you like to speak to this motion? No, thank you. Any councillors like to speak against this motion? Uh, no further speakers, I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? 
Against? You declare that carried. I'll now move on to DCF 619, Bonwick Street. Councillor Farnley's on his feet. Bonwick Street Streetscape upgrade commence procedures for laneway closures. Yes, I'd like to move the uh, a slight amendment to the council officer's recommendation. That is on number, point number four. We uh, input councillor of the, uh, okay. North East Ward councillors. Councillor Abu, there, in that spot. <laughs> and uh, in the other ones, you've got councillor Bolton, Carly Hannan, and Era Family. I'm happy to second. And one more change. On point number five, uh, oh, we'll just let you finish that bit. Yep. Point number five, where it says uh, at the Moreland Civic Centre, 90 Bell Street, can we just highlight that and change that to the Faulkner Senior yes. Citizen Centre? Mm -hmm. I'm happy to second that. Faulkner flavour, what do you think? <laughs> you second that? I'm, happy to, I'm very happy to second it, especially the changes. Um, That's a better idea. You like that one? Mm -hmm. Talk good. to the motion, Councillor okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, This is something, um, so uh, Council has resolved a position in regards to the changes on Bonwick Street and as part of the legislation requirements, we need to consult the community on laneway closures, which was part of the streetscape master plan for Bonwick Street. This is that uh, process being followed through. Thank you. Brilliant. Um, just as a seconder, I'd like to commend the subtle changes. Well done, Councillor Farmley, and very happy to second this. Very excited about Bonwick Street, as I'm sure all of the North East Ward and Moreland City Council is up. Are there any speakers who would like to speak against this motion? Any other speakers that would like to speak to the motion? Just because it's Bonwick Street. Uh, if no further speakers, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? I declare that carried. Now move to EMF 319, the financial management report for the period ending 31st of December 2018, including mid-year financial review uh, cyclical report. Councillor Riley, do I have a second up? I'm happy to second that from the chair. No one else is interested. Councillor Riley, would you like to speak to this? Yeah, report? just um, briefly, um, this is our mid-year report um, and the figures are looking um, quite outstanding, really. Um, we are improving our expenditure on capital works and we are trying to spend as much as that is possible each year and get some improvement on that because it's one of our major uh, areas. Uh, one of the other big uh, items that's affected our budget this time is the cost of um, some of our services and um, mainly around electricity supply after we've ended a long contract, even though we're going on to the Melbourne Energy Renewal Project, otherwise known as MREP, and I've probably got that around the wrong way, but that's, um, right. that's, right. that's our new wind farm out of Woodlands, and um, that started Crowland. produce Crowland, sorry, thank you, right Mayor Wood, get my frozen woods right. So Crowlands is out um, in the Western Victoria, and they started producing power on the first of January, but they won't finish going to full speed and producing um, full supply of energy there till around April or so. So um, whilst there's a bit of changeover, we're not getting the benefit, the full benefit of that at this stage, I believe. So hopefully that will be um, improved uh, in the future. But that is just one of the um, big changes that's happened uh, in the budget. But otherwise, given that and all the other issues, we're still in a very healthy um, state. So I commend the officers and all the work that they've been doing um, to manage the budget. Um, I think that's we're in a very good state. And given it's a rate capped environment, it's an even better result. Um, I'd just like to draw everybody's attention to those figures because they're pretty impressive figures and this organisation is delivering and I think that that stuff is reflected in the finance um, report and it's well worth delving into if you do numbers. Are there any other councillors who would like to speak against the report? Any other councillors who would like to speak in support of this motion? Uh, no further speakers. I'll put this to the vote. All those in favour? Against, declare that carried. I now move on to DBT 219, the Governance Report, February 2019, uh, which is a cyclical report. Do I have a mover? Councillor Kavanagh? Seconder? Councillor Davidson? Councillor Kavanagh, would you like to speak to this? Councillor Davidson? No, I'm sorry, I'm going to, I'd like to, just briefly. Yeah. 
This is a, an omnibus report, so there's lots of stuff in it, but the one I would really want to um, highlight is the, the family violence prevention strategy that we're working on, in, in, and it covers many aspects of what we do in council, from early childhood to um, our Oxygen Youth program to internal staff training and development, and it just goes on. Um, family violence is something that affects us every day. Um, the number of responses that police have to make in our city and across Victoria is quite extraordinary. And there's been a number of inquiries and um, around this of late and other um, inquiries around abuse, and we've got one happening into aged care at the moment. So they all kind of tie in in my thinking, and I just think this is important for people to acknowledge the work we're doing there and thank the officers, um, along with um, a bunch of other works there, but uh, to do with our water and risk and, and uh, some councillor expenses and resources policy, which is a bit dry, but it's making sure that we are actually being held accountable and the way that we spend our money if we're doing trips and so on. So um, we are trying to tighten that down and be very clear about how we do that. So I think it's all good work and uh, commend people to have a closer look at that. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Are there any other councillors that would like to speak to this motion? No, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against, declare that carried. I'll now move to DCF 719, uh, contract 652T, Craigieburn Shared User Path, Stage 2, Devon Road to Bothell Street, Pasco Vale. Councillor Kavanagh, Councillor Davidson. Councillor Kavanagh, would you like to speak to the... Just very briefly, this is another step on the journey of having a Craigieburn uh, Shared Path uh, for bikes and the pedestrians. and. Uh, uh, you know, it's piecing together. It's like the pieces in a jigsaw puzzle. It's coming together over a period of time, and this is another step forward. So pleased to see it. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Councillor Davidson, would you like no, to speak? Nothing further to add. Anybody like to speak against this motion? Any other speakers? Or well, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. DCF 819, contract 748T, Brunswick Town Hall and Mechanics Institute Four Courts Upgrade, Council Action Plan Item D19-32058. Councillor Riley, the seconder for that motion? I'm happy to second from the Chair. Councillor Riley, would you like to speak? Uh, just briefly, this is a bit exciting because it's to do with part of the, the key sort of focus for Brunswick and, and our city. It's an iconic location on Sydney Road. Um, there are major works going to happen outside the, the actual town hall um, on the, the streetscape footpath as well as the forecourt for the Mechanics Institute. Um, and it's going to be a, a bit of a disruption for us, but given the works that happened on Dawson Street last year and the outcomes there, I'm rather excited about what will happen. A number of trees coming out along the, the edge of the Mechanics Institute um, are having to be removed, so just be aware of that. And they won't be replaced with quite the same number, but the canopy and the shade provisions on the new trees should be better than what we've already got. So hopefully the outcome will be even better than what we have now in terms of people being able to enjoy shade at this time of the year um, when we need it. So just be aware of that, please, um, and um, look forward to the outcomes. In terms of the finishes on the services, there's been some discussion around that um, amongst councillors and officers. Um, in some of the contracts that we've let recently, and we have had some reports back to sort of cover off on that to make sure that the, there's some uh, roughing of the service to make it less slippery, but we're also wanting to make sure that that's quite workable for people using wheelchairs and pushes and prams and stuff. So um, we are working on that and making sure that we get the, the best outcomes to meet everybody's needs. So I'm really excited about this work. Thank you, Councillor Riley. Are there any other, are there any councillors who'd like to speak against the motion? Any other councillors who would like to speak at all, uh, put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. I'll now move on to DCI 119, contract SS 2018 oh, state purchase contract. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Councillor Martin, would you like to um, state your conflict before you sneak out? Um, yeah, so again, uh, it was a conflict due to, uh, perceived conflict um, due to uh, conflicting work duties. Thank you, Councillor Martin. I'll come and get you. Uh, so, supply of motor vehicles. Um, do I have a mover? Councillor Carly Hannon, and a seconder for this report? 
Councillor Kavanagh, Councillor Carly Carlyhan, would you like to speak to this report? Councillor Kavanagh? Not for me, thanks. Any speakers against this report? Uh, put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. Could someone please find Councillor Martin? Hopefully, it didn't go too far. <laughs> didn't. No cheese for him. <laughs> okay, so I'll now move um, on to the notices of motion. And the first notice of motion, uh, sorry, councillors, I'll first ask that you start by stating the motion and then provide a brief, brief background. The first notice of motion we have this evening is uh, 119, apartment building defects. Councillor Walton. So the motion is that council writes to the Victorian Premier Daniel Andrews calling for an inquiry into apartment building defects. The purpose of the inquiry would be to one, ascertain the extent and type of building defects in apartment complexes and two, make recommendations to increase building regulation to decrease the number of defects and protect purchasers. Um, Secondly, uh, copies of the letter should be sent to the State Member for Brunswick, um, uh, Tim Reid, State Member for Pascoval, Lizzie Blanthorne, and Northern Metropolitan Members of um, the Legislative Council. In addition, um, issue a public statement calling for such an inquiry. And lastly, that um, a proposal for an inquiry be taken to the Municipal Association of Victoria and the Victorian Local Government Association. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Do I have a seconder for Councillor Bolton's motion? Uh, I'm happy to second that, but I wanted to suggest a small amendment, which is that we include the member for Broadmeadows. Oh, uh, yeah. Um, happy to do that. Yeah. Frank Maguire. Okay. <laughs> so my reason for moving uh, this motion is um, that we all saw the... Um, terrible disaster of the Oakle Towers, uh, where people, um, you know, people were forced to move out um, of the Opal Tower just before Christmas, move back in, move out, move back in. And there was a big public <coughs> debate across Australia about the number of building defects in apartments. Then more recently in Melbourne, we had a fire in Spencer Street. Uh, where flammable cladding caught a light and um, went up the side of the building very fast. In the case of the Spencer Street um, fire, uh, the um, building inspector ticked off the building. They signed off uh, on the um, on the certificate on the certificate and signed off all the paperwork. But unbeknownst to them, the builder had used. Uh, flammable cladding rather than what had been um, recorded in the paperwork. Um, there often are no physical inspections made of buildings. Often the building inspector's inspection is purely from their de desk and not actually on site. Um, is, um, one of the research papers about, the, um, about apartment defects uh, it was a project done in 2012, um, surveying around 1,000 apartment owners in New South Wales, um, found that 72% of people um, were aware of defects in their strata title complex. For people in apartments built since 2000, the number of defects climbed, with the percentage being 85% of residents knowing of defects in their apartments. Most of these tend not to be the big cracking um, like we saw in the Opal Tower, but a lot of it is about leaking because developers are choosing uh, cheaper methods, cheaper and nasty methods, leaving residents, um, whether they're owners or tenants, to deal with the mess um, long after the developers you know, sold off and gone away. And who's liable in these situations? Um, this is a social equity issue because actually a lot of um, apartment buyers tend to be people, maybe first homeowners, can't afford a house, so buy an apartment instead. 
often they often are people who don't have as much money and yet they're left with these disasters to deal with. Um, it is estimated that by people in the industry that in uh, across Australia, there are similar levels of defects to what um, were discovered in New South Wales in, in this particular survey. So I think it's only logical that other states, including Victoria, have an inquiry into this into the building industry. Um, a lot of uh, body corporate managers are finding massive problems in a lot of the apartment complexes. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. So um, I think Moreland should um, initiate um, a campaign for an inquiry into the, these apartment buildings. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, if I can ask a question, I think Councillor Bolton, you wanted to add additional dot points to the um, notice of motion that you circulated mm. initially, didn't you? I just want to make sure it was reflected on the... Um, it's not on the screen. It's on the screen, that's all, so we can all see it. Well, those are the two points that you're asking for? Yeah. Thank you, Councillor Afanli. Um, as the seconder, I think this is one of the ways we can move to encourage and um, oversee better development in the city. I don't think it's the only way. This is after the fact, as opposed to applying that stuff before developments are even applied for to be built before the applications come in. Um, but I don't think it's gonna get much of a result. Um, and I am supporting it because one of the things that happens uh, with these defect buildings is not only, not only the implications um, in terms of the investment, but people who are living in these buildings with these um, defects are finding that body corporates are not doing all the basic things like fixing locks on the front gate or making the building safe anymore. Um, and I think that the more this issue is raised in a public um, eye, in a public forum, the better off it will be. Uh, I think there's a lot of really bad buildings being built, um, not only in our city, but right across the whole state. So I'm happy to support Councillor Bolton's notice of motion. And I encourage other councillors to do the same. Are there any councillors who'd like to speak against the motion? Anybody else in support? I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. Just to clarify, Councillor Bolton, you couldn't close the debate because nobody spoke against. Notice of, notice of motion 219, support of a return season of serenading Adela. Can I move a slightly different amendment to the one, do you, slightly different to the one up there? Point one stays the same. Point two. Uh, it changes to provide free use of council venues during 2009, 2019, comma, as per June 30, uh, 13, 2018 resolution, comma, subject to availability. If I have a second, I'll explain why. Well, Councillor Riley has already expressed yep. no his worries. desire to second the motion. Good. Um, the only reason I've asked to change that is because uh, the original motion had uh, use for rehearsal at Fleming Park as well whereas the second point just had Coburg Town Hall. So um, currently the serenading Adela may or may not go ahead, depending on whether they're successful in uh, further grants that they're seeking. And we uh, just, so the April deadline, the April term that we had in the first resolution uh, won't be achievable, but hopefully by the end of 19, uh, 2019, they'll have received those grants and we'll be able to put it on. Because I can tell you now, councillors, if you didn't get to the first one, then they do put it on, get to it, because it was fantastic. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Um, Councillor Riley, would you like to speak? No? Uh, any councillors like to speak against the motion? Uh, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? I declare that carried. I now move on to notice of motion 319, resident access to plans during public notification period. Councillor Bolton. Uh, so this is a very simple motion that council receives a report with recommendations to make copies of plans accessible to residents who are not businesses at a reasonable cost. I just have a question about this. Is that capped at all or anybody forever until they stop coming to ask? Like, is there any kind of criteria to determine? Well, I said not businesses and I thought we would get a report which would make some recommendations. So I'm not um, being prescriptive one way or the other at the moment. Yeah. Um, is anybody interested in seconding Councillor Bolton's motion? I'll second. Councillor Kavanagh? 
Councillor Bolton, would you like to speak to the motion? Yes. Well, earlier tonight we heard a resident say that um, they had to pay seven hundred dollars in order to um, get um, copies of the plans for a development in their local area um, when they would approach council. Now, in that particular case, it wasn't the resident themselves who paid all of the money, but it came out of a pool that um, some residents had collected over years. But most residents are not going to be in that position. Um, I understand from the council officer's comments um, around the motion that appear in the agenda that um, there was only one, um, you know, excessive, um, you know, payment um, made for plans in that period. But the fact that there was only one excessive payment made doesn't mean that there might not have been other residents who um, really wanted to access the plans and maybe didn't proceed with objections because they couldn't afford the plans. Um, not all residents have, uh, especially older residents, have access to the internet or if they have access to the internet, they might only be able to plan, um, print out the plans on A4 paper, which doesn't really necessarily um, give people the feeling of um, the whole development. I think this is an equity issue. Um, the residents who appeared earlier indicated they would have been prepared to pay a certain amount of money, but $700 is just prohibitive for you know, almost any resident. So um, I'm you know, not putting forward a definite proposal as to what the um, cost should be, um, but I think we need some recommendations to come back to council um, I guess the only proviso I've put in the motion that it not be sort of like a commercial entity, um, but you know maybe we could make some sort of you know when the report comes back to council we could make some sort of um, you know um, parameters such as maybe residents on a low income or something along those lines. So, but I'd rather see the report come back to council and then us make an assessment then. Councillor Kavanagh. Just briefly, um, the reason why I'm seconding is because it is calling for a report. Um, I flagged that I wouldn't be supportive of people like giving free um, plans, but I do think possibly, as Councillor Bolton has said, let the officers come back with some sort of proposal that seems fair and reasonable. I also wouldn't be supporting retrospective. If people have paid for the things in the past, then I'm sorry, that's in my view, that's how it is. But, um, but I do think... Um, Although that was quite exceptional amount of photocopying of 268 A4 pages and 97 A3 pages, certainly $628 is an enormous amount of money to pay. Thank you, Councillor Kavanagh. Are there any councillors that would like to speak against the notice of motion? Councillor Martin? Yep. Um, I'd just like to speak um, against this motion. Um, currently, the price is acting as a disincentive for residents to come and print paper. Um, we are currently in a climate emergency and emissions from forestry accounts for a large uh, chunk of that. And so I think we should be continuing to provide a disincentive for residents. Uh, we have digital services at our libraries that residents can take up if they're interested in, in learning how to use a computer. Um, and I don't want to see the floodgates open where we're turning into office works here at uh, Moreland Council. Thank you, Councillor Martin. Councillor Tapanos. Uh, um, rise to propose an alternative, um, and that is that um, we defer this to the budget discussion. Um, I do think that uh, these financial uh, motions are better discussed in the broader scheme of the budget. I wouldn't want to necessarily see another report of what it would cost us. Um, I actually want to see the discussion as part of the fees and charges component of our budget. So, Councillor Tapanos, are you asking Councillor Bolton to withdraw the motion? with a view to talking about it um, in the budget process, or are you expressing that you won't be supporting the motion? Uh, I'm expressing that I won't be supporting it and moving an alternative if, if this fails. Thank you, Councillor Tapanos. Are there any other, are there any councillors who would like to speak in support of the motion now that we have had a councillor speak against? No? Uh, if there are no further comments, I'll put that to the vote. All those in... Yeah, you can, yep. Yeah. Thank you. Um, just in response to Councillor Martin, I don't think this is, will open floodgates, 
because I think people who have access to the facilities, people who are very digitally literate, uh, probably are unlikely to come to council and ask to have plans photocopied. I think the people who are likely to need to get copies of the plans photocopied to council are people who are not digitally literate or, or don't have the facilities. Um, which I think is a uh, decreasing uh, number of people in the community. Um, I think it is a simple equity issue. And for councillors who think I'm um, saying this has to be free, um, the words in the motion are reasonable cost. It's a question of how we ass um, assess what a reasonable cost is. Um, but I think it is simply a social equity issue um, because otherwise then I think we're saying you know, people who've got lots of facilities and so forth are able to participate in the debate of what sort of planning we should have in the city. People who don't have those facilities and uh, may not have that sort of training are not uh, allowed to participate in public debate about planning, including planning that might affect their particular area. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, since Councillor Bolton has closed the debate, I'll put that to the vote. All those in favour? Against? I'll uh, declare that lost. No, well, then, can I move that this um, be referred to the budget process? Do you want to? Yeah, can we just get? Yeah, thank you. Oh, so, just through the mayor, uh, you wouldn't need any um, motion for us to consider that as part of the budget process. Um, we will take that away as something that could be considered through that and then you can have the discussion again during the budget. And who does it need a second? Uh, you won't need a motion, you don't need to vote on it, we'll just take it's it away as officers. Oh, okay, as yep. officers will just do it, fine. Yep. Thank you, Noreena. Um, notice of motion 419, uh, can I just confirm, Councillor Bolton, that say parking norm has been withdrawn? Yes, because uh, okay. it's been yeah. free. Yeah. <laughs> Hurrah. <Okay. laughs> okay, so moving on. Not another refugee should say. Okay, thank you. That is true. Um, we now move on to notices of rescission, and there are none. So we'll move on to foreshadowed items. And councillors, do you have any foreshadowed items that you that may be subject, uh, may be the subject of a notice of motion for the next council meeting? Councillor Bolton, um, I've got one which I've already submitted, which is about access to Moreland halls for open table which provides free community lunches for people who are struggling. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Councillor Martin. Um, I'd just like to um, let people know that I'll be moving a motion in relating to um, our stormwater system um, and the drains and actually a, a stamp or a stencil program to create um, a, a level of awareness um, that our stormwater drains actually go out into our creeks. Thank you, Councillor Bolton. Uh, Councillor Martin, sorry. <laughs> Are there any other councillors that would like to foreshadow any potential notices of motions for the future? Um, I'll now move to urgent business. I have no urgent business items on the agenda. Um, so this is the part where I thank the gallery and close the meeting to the public. Thank you very much. Oh, sorry, I need a resolution to close the meeting. Uh, Councillor, Councillor Riley, Councillor Davidson. All those in favour? Against? Declare that carried. I declare the council meeting closed to the public at 9.20. I'd like to thank the gallery attendees and also thank those watching live streaming for your interest in council matters and respectfully request that the public kindly leave, but they're gone, um, and wish you all...